All right. Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Um, first of all, are there any developers in the room? Okay, a couple, a couple. Um, you'll probably pick up a couple of things, but you know, you're not really our, our core audience. But welcome anyway. It's going to be great. Um, so uh, we are both from Evolving Web. Uh, my name is uh, Jesse. I am a, a solutions architect uh, with Evolving Web. Uh, I've been with the, the team for about two and a half, going on three years now. Um, Ten years of web development experience as a full stack developer on a couple of different uh, open source platforms, of course, including Drupal. Um, and as a solutions architect, my role is oftentimes a lot more in the uh, earlier phases of a project, the planning, the discovery, um, and then that's sort of acting as like support throughout the development phases. Uh, but um, yeah, so that's kind of, that's me. And uh, that's me. So I'm, uh, I'm Maya, I'm a Drupal developer at Evolving Web. I've been here for less than a year, actually. And I've been a Drupal developer for four years now. Uh, before that, I used to be a journalist. And uh, yes, I do a bit of training as well uh, for Evolving Web. So if you subscribe for the training that is going to be tomorrow, uh, you'll see me as well. All right, so who is Evolving Web? Um, we are a full service digital agency. We're based in uh, Montreal in Canada. Uh, we work with uh, a whole bunch of organizations as you might recognize some here, uh, but organizations that want to make a big impact in the world. Um, lots of higher education clients, healthcare, government, um, various uh, institutions like that. Uh, we've been working on Drupal for probably, well, 15 plus years, maybe 16 or 17 now. Um, and we're about 85 to 90 uh, developers, designers, strategists, et cetera. Um, so yeah, so these are just a couple of our, of our clients that we've worked with. Um, one particular one, since we're talking about migrations today, uh, this was a major migration project that we did uh, for the Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. It was, uh, at the time, a Drupal 7 to 9 uh, migration. I think we've since upgraded to 10, um, if I can sure of it. Um, so yeah, we migrated a bunch of content. Um, at the same time, did some UX and redesign work and helped integrate the site into the larger Princeton ecosystem. Um, so that's one of our projects. And another one I wanted to mention was uh, for the Quebec Tourism uh, Agency. So we're in Montreal, Quebec, uh, the province of Quebec. Um, so Bonjour Quebec is uh, the agency that sort of does all the, the tourism. Um, and so we migrated uh, about 10,000 uh, pages uh, or, or pieces of content into Drupal from a, an another platform um, and brought it all in, built a, a nice, really, really nice interactive map. So if anybody's ever in uh, Quebec, uh, you can go to the site to figure out what you want to do while you're visiting. Um, so why is that important? Well, we're here talking about content migrations. Um, so we've done a lot of migrations. Uh, and so basically we just want to share a bit about how we do that. Um, I did mention earlier I am a developer, but not much of a Drupal developer these days. Um, so my involvement in these projects are a bit different. Like I was saying, more on the sort of planning side of things. Uh, we don't really get too much into code. Um, and so um, we thought we would share how we've, how we've you know, structured a lot of our migrations, but from a bit of a different perspective, uh, what we've learned about how to do these migrations, but you know, thinking more about the, um, the designers, the project managers, the, the, the site owners, site builders, et cetera. Before we get into uh, you know, uh, content, website content migrations, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about uh, different type of, of migrations, so you know, uh, human uh, migrations, which I think is something that we've done a lot of uh, throughout our existence. Um, and they might not look quite like this anymore, but you know, they, they, they have, haven't changed all that much in the end. Um, and it's interesting because actually both of us have recently done some migrations in, our, in, our, in the past little while. Um, I recently moved uh, myself from central Canada uh, all the way east to, to Montreal. Um, and in my case, this was in the continent, in the country. Uh, so it's actually pretty easy just to load up this U-Haul and drive halfway across the, the, the country. Um, pack up all of my stuff, 2,500 kilometers over four days, um, just with me and my wife and some plants and all of our belongings. Um, and we had about six months of this. This is an actual photo of our, of our living room uh, in our old apartment. Uh, it's messy. Um, lots of organizing, purging, selling stuff off, trying to rent out our place, packing. Um, it's, it was a lot, a, lot, a lot of work. 
And ultimately, we ended up keeping a lot more than we probably should have, which meant we ended up with something like this uh, when we actually uh, moved. Uh, so also equally messy. Um, we brought, again, way too much stuff. And really what we learned is we should have done a lot better with our planning and cleaning up and purging and, and, and everything earlier on. Uh, <clears throat> me, on the other hand, uh, around the same time JC was coming from Central Canada to East Canada, I was moving from France to Canada. And so going to a whole new continent meant that I couldn't bring all my stuff with me. I had to get rid of most of it, basically. And it was not compatible anyway. So this is what my <laughs> house <laughs> actually looked like when I arrived near Montreal. So clean slate, nice and smooth migration. <laughs> And in a way, planning this, this migration was way easier than Jesse's because all of my content needed to be like net new. So basically, we kind of have two different kinds of migrations here. The, the first one being the let's start over again and uh, just you know, start, start fresh versus the let's bring everything over and deal with it all later kind of migration. Um, so really, the, the, the question becomes, what is the right way to do a content migration? Um, and the answer kind of is, well, neither one is actually incorrect. Um, both of these are entirely valid ways to migrate. And in fact, most of our, our website migration projects actually end up being both, a little bit of both. Um, but the important thing is that we take the time to understand what we're going to do and what that process is going to look like, uh, and uh, just figure out what our intentions are going to be and plan out what that migration is going to look like for different sections of the site maybe in different, different areas. Um, so at this point, we know that we're doing a big uh, migration. Um, so you know, whether it's from Drupal 7 to 10 or soon enough 11, uh, or uh, proprietary CMS maybe into Drupal or, or anything along those lines, the, the planning is definitely going to be the most important part of this process. Um, and this brings us to the first phase of the migration, which is the, the discovery, and this is where you avoid uh, future issues, basically. The discovery, according to Wikipedia, uh, discovery is the act of detecting something new or something previously unrecognized as meaningful, and that's exactly what we are doing, exactly what you are going to do. Um, it's by far, I'm, gonna, I'm going to say that a lot, but it's by far the most important part of your, of your migration. If your migration is of any particular size, if your website is of any particular size, you need to spend time on this. It's worth taking the time. You might want to jump right in because, of course, you know your website, you're working on it every day, you know your content, you know what you want to achieve in your new website. So you might want to jump right in, but it's not a good idea, basically, because uh, you'll find, uh, during the discovery phase, you'll phase, sorry, you'll find a lot of cobwebs, a lot of content that you've forgo forgotten about. And if developers have to deal with that um, during the, the, the actual migration process, it's going to take way much more time. So the sooner the better. You need to, to, to discover your content and it's going to be uh, better for, for the rest of your migration. Also, if you want to do some uh, redesign, like changing a bit your content, it's easier to design new components um, and decide how to put your old content in, into those new components uh, earlier in the process. So this is uh, an actual Drupal proverb, measure twice, cut once, so yes, this is very accurate right now. You need to document everything that you discover, otherwise it might as well not exist. And this is uh, very important. We typically produce uh, quite a few documents from discovery, and among them, Jesse's favorite, and he's going to show it to you later, spreadsheets. And it might not be the sexiest thing to do or the most enjoyable, but again, it's worth it. Developers are going to need those documents to do their work. So you need to list what do you have on your website? Maybe you have content types and taxonomies and you need to know how they are structured, if they are structured, because maybe your content is just put into a giant, gigantic WYSIWYG editor and developers need to know that. You might have uh, files that you want to migrate, images, PDFs, documents that you want to migrate to your new website. You might have user accounts with some rules and some permissions that you want to migrate as well. You might have blogs, 
you might have uh, views, you might have some redirects, and maybe some redirects you inherited from a previous migrations, and you want those redirects to still work on your new website. So you need to take care of those and document those. And you might even have some modules if you're already on Drupal website, like some modules that, uh, some custom modules maybe, that are doing some specific things for your website. And you need to document those, tell the developers exactly what they are doing because they might need to update those modules to be compatible with Drupal 10 or Drupal 7, and so they need to exactly know what they are doing, what they are doing, and why. And it keeps going. You you didn't saw web forms on the last slides, but I bet you have web forms on your website as well, and you need to migrate those. The thing is, you are as as a content editor or as a product owner or whatever. You you are probably the expert on one area of your website, whether it is content, design, governance, and you are the expert, and you are here to tell the developers and point out what's, what's missing. I'm going to say it again. Don't underestimate discovery. The bigger your, your website, the less organized uh, your data is. The more chance we have to discover things even after this discovery phase is done. So that's why it needs to be very thorough. And I mentioned this before, but make sure you give the discovery the right amount of time. It will, in the end, it will save you time, it will save you some complications, and it will save you money. Consider embarking on that redesign, or at least a refresh. More often than not, uh, at some point in discovery, it's appropriate to reconsider maybe a redesign given everything that you've learned. At some point, you're going to know everything that you have on your website, that's the point of discovery. So you might want to change things a bit to have a better thing on, on your new website. We've had projects uh, where migration was needed, but let's say, for example, from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10, but a redesign was not desired. Like the, the, the goal was simply to rebuild things on a new uh, updated platform, but not change anything. We would suggest that it's, um, there are very few cases where this is a good idea. We typically recommend to take this opportunity, this discovery phase, this migration phase, to at least refresh the design, maybe fix some uh, accessibility issues that you have on your website, fix some long-term maintenance issues that you've been having that are sitting on your backlog for two, three, four, five months. It, now it's the time to take care of that so when you got your new website up and running, you don't have to worry about those anymore. And then, once you've done all that, your discovery phase will be done, and you can move on to the next phase. And at this point, that's probably going to become the what we like to call the big cleanup. Uh, so probably what I didn't do enough when moving. Um, but this is when you're addressing the, 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 the content and everything on your site and trying to figure out uh, what you're going to do with it all. Um, so we like to sort of think of it in this way that you don't need to uh, QA things that you didn't migrate. It's kind of something that someone on our team says a lot. Um, and I think it's very true that, you know, there's a lot of testing that we're going to talk about later that we can really avoid if we just, you know, are able to spend some time earlier on and, and clean things up uh, uh, properly. Um, so, uh, what do we want to do? We have, we now know what we have, and so we have to decide uh, what do we want to keep what do we want maybe to merge? And maybe what do we want to trash or just get rid of? Or maybe it's more of a rewriting at this point. Um, and actually, that's probably one of the, the biggest parts is really deciding what you want to omit as opposed to what you want to keep. And that will include things like uh, revisions or uh, comments on, on, on your nodes, um, moderation status even, um, things like old events or old news. You might consider how you want to handle those. Um, and when you're, when you're sort of considering maybe what to remove, it's worth also considering how that might affect the, the SEO of the website. Uh, we've often heard things like, I don't care about that old blog, it's not relevant anymore. Uh, but if you all of a sudden remove a thousand pages from your website uh, of, of content that might actually still be valuable, it might, uh, it might really affect uh, your, your, your rankings. So do consider that at the same time and use your analytics data uh, as well to, to help you determine some of that. 
Um, so at this point, maybe we know what we have uh, and we know what we're doing with it all. Uh, so this is now the time to create some, some, some mapping. So we're going to map um, content types and, and fields and whatnot. So um, this is the ch chance where we can uh, bring some order to maybe what was some, some previous chaos in, your, in the content structure of, of, a, of a website. Um, so what are we looking for in this process? Uh, we're trying to create some, some structure again. So there might be some areas that you found on your site that are like uncategorized groups of content uh, that might make sense to be moved into a new content type. Uh, there could be, of course, you'll have old content types that you want to move into their new content types, their, their respective new content types. You might have some unstructured uh, page content, maybe in its own content type already, but it should, you, we can add some new structure to that with some new custom fields that we, so we can enhance the, the structure there. Uh, Hard-coded components, perhaps, that are maybe in the WYSIWYG editor or something that you found that are being used across the whole site that you want to create uh, new blocks based on those. Um, there might also be some old custom fields uh, that you're just going to port directly into uh, some new custom fields. Um, and there might even be things like, like, like you know, text-based keywords that maybe weren't set up as uh, vocabularies uh, previously and you want to ask you now. Again, create that, that, that structure for the, for the new site. So taking this time to do it all at, at this point is, um, is going to really help you out in the potential future migrations, in your um, design and development phases, and, and for the life cycle of the website. So how do we track this? We use something that we just call a, a data transfer table. It is just this giant spreadsheet, more or less. Um, but we have a ton of different tabs on there. Uh, and so really, we're mapping everything in here. We're mapping the content types, uh, but also then all the fields in those content types. We're tracking all the types of fields that they are. Um, maybe any like transformations that we might need to do if we need to extract some content from some previously unstructured content. Um, and it really doesn't matter how simple uh, something, how simple your migration might be. Uh, we find it's always still good to, to track all of this, to document all of this at this point. So this is a pretty complicated one, but it's a big spreadsheet to, to, to keep track of. So wh while you are building this, this, uh, this big spreadsheet, you need to start thinking about how you are going to migrate each kind of content or things that you have on your website. And for this, you have two options, automated, or manual. You'd want to go with automated if you have on your website large amounts of contents. For example, if you have 10,000 pages, 10,000 articles that you want to move to your new website, you might want to go with automated. If your content is highly structured, if you already have fields, if you already have like a defined structure for your contents, you might want to go with automated as well. And if you have a high frequency of changes in your content, you might want to go with automated as well because it's going to allow you to change your content on your actual website right until the end, until the, the actual migration day, or almost, but we are going to talk about that later. On the other hand, if you want to do a, a content refresh of your website, uh, if you know that things are going to change, um, in your content types, it makes less sense to automate. If a uh, content type has a small amount of content on your website, for example, uh, landing pages or your homepage, it doesn't make sense to automate the process because it will take too much time for the developers to create a script to migrate this instead of just redoing it uh, manually. And in the end, if your content is highly unstructured, like for example, like I was saying before, if all of your content is put into a gigantic WYSIWYG editor. It's going to be hard for developers to create accurate scripts to migrate your content. So you might want to go with uh, a manual migration at this time. OK, so now it's time to actually start the migration. We've got it all planned. We know what's going where and, and how. Um, so let's actually now you know, make it happen. Um, this will look different, def definitely depending on the migration. So it'll, you know, it'll definitely vary what that process looks like. Um, and there is definitely going to be a lot of work uh, coming up. Um, so we can assume that you'll probably have some help already lined up. Uh, in the chance that you don't, we know some people that can help with that. Uh, we're pretty good movers, um, but let's assume that you do. Uh, so. 
the devs are going to be the ones doing a lot of that work, writing scripts, doing ETLs and ABCs and waving magic wands. But what we are doing in the end is not, not magic, at least not entirely. We just have the Drupal Book of Spells, which I recommend. And we just, we're just using it to, to do the migrations. Um, and what we are doing really is, is building and rerunning the migrations over and over many times. Putting data from the original website, uh, changing it in the way that is described in the spreadsheets, and push it on the new website until it fits. And we typically do that um, a lot of times, over and over, and with little tweaks each time. We, we add new rules to the migrations, we tweak those rules until it, it fits perfectly. But what about you? That, that's not your job, that's the developer's job. So what's expected of you and what should you expect? Let's cover what this process uh, looks for you. So this is kind of a high level of, of what that migration will look like, right? You, the developers are going to write some scripts and figure stuff out, and then um, they'll run some test runs. Everything will be good, and then they'll just launch the, the new site. But I mean, maybe there's some missing steps in there, actually. What we would actually do is you know, run, write, write a bunch of scripts, uh, test it, going to run into some problems, um, probably going to have some questions. Uh, there's going to be some changes that need to happen in the scripts. They might even ask for changes in the content to help make some of these migrations easier. Um, this is all part of the process. It's actually really important to not be you know, deterred by this. Uh, don't be worried about it. It'll happen. Uh, it's going to be this sort of cycle that needs to happen. Um, they will un under developers will uncover a lot in this process. It might be an old module that you installed two years ago and never removed. It might be um, you know, random embedded widgets in, and scripts and styles in the, in the CK editor. Um, each one of these things that we run into, we're going to need some discussion time, um, some uh, figuring out the solution, and then we'll have to develop that solution probably, uh, maybe make those content changes back on the source site, uh, and then we'll test them again, and maybe there's some more iteration in there. So that's all part of the process that's totally ex expected. Um, so then we were, we're at that point, we're just good, we've done all of our work, and we're ready to launch. Well, actually, there's a, still a missing step in there, which is for the content team, the owners of the site, to actually do some testing. Um, and so this is really what that, again, high level, but really what that whole process looks like. Um, so we get to that, that, that UAT uh, uh, section, which is the user acceptance testing. Um, so that's, that's really the, the last missing piece in there. Um, and so, yeah, so what's going to, to be your job throughout this, this phase? First, you need to plan your content freeze. Um, freezes are always needed. At some point, you are go going to need to stop editing, stop creating new content, stop changing things on your website because developers are going to run some last test with the actual content that is going to be mi migrated on the big day. And for this, your content needs to stay absolutely the same. We know it's hard sometimes to, to do that because this phase ca could last like several days, a week, maybe two weeks sometimes if we find some complications. So it needs a lot of preparations, a lot of communications with your content editors, with everybody involving in your website. But this is uh, really important. You'll need a content freeze at some point. It's really hard to avoid. And we also recommend to trying to fix the issues that we find uh, at the source. The developers will constantly be running tests, finding new issues, and finding content that maybe doesn't conform with what is uh, expected. And fi fixing those issues at the source in your original website, it will make the big migration uh, easier. Fixing them in the destination, like after the, the migrations, it restricts the ability to rerun migrations uh, and it has to be done really late in the process. And you'll need to keep, to keep track of all of those issues, all of those content changes somewhere and you'll need to do that after the migration. And it's going to take time and it's going, maybe not going to be as accurate as if you've done it right away on your, on your source. But we know that that's not always possible. So sometimes we can fix those issues in the actual script that we are going to use to do the migration. But when possible, really, we found that it's easier 
to fix those issues in the source, it will avoid uh, future issues. And it allows for an easier reuse of the migrations. So generally then, at, at a certain point in this migration, you're probably dealing with a bunch of other changes on the website that probably will also include changes to the general URL structure of the site. Um, and that's actually okay, that's probably actually desired, uh, but only if you have redirects in place to handle that change as well. Uh, if not, it can really negatively affect, the, again, the SEO, the, the, the rankings of your website. Um, so we usually create a redirect mapping uh, spreadsheet, again, um, and keep track of what the old URL structure would be, what the new one is going to be, um, and, and make sure that we have that ready to go so that when later on the developers can set up those redirects. It's also worth talking to the developers because it might be possible that there's a way to do a sort of a bulk redirect or using like a wildcard style of, of, of rule. And that just means we can redirect a whole set of URLs all at once with one simple rule in, in, the, in the back end. Um, so there's also something to consider here again when we're cleaning up content. If you're deleting a bunch of content, um, you can't redirect that old URL to somewhere new uh, because that, that content probably won't match. I mean, unless it does, there might be some cases where it will, but um, you, you could, in theory, make that redirect so that it goes from an old URL to a new URL that is completely different in content, but um, search engines these days are smart enough to realize that, and they're not going to carry over that ranking, and you'll get basically no, uh, no, no benefit from, no SEO benefit, at least, from that, from that redirect. And that might not be the primary driver, but, but the SEO is worth considering there as well. And then we have uh, some, some tools that we like to use in this process. So this is the Google Search Console. Um, it's worth considering earlier on in the process that you should have access to this. It should be set up and collecting data, basically, because it can take some time to really start to surface data. Um, so there's the Google version, there's a Bing Webmaster Tools, and a lot of the other you know, major search engines will have their own as well. So just taking the time to make sure that you have that access ahead of time for a, you know, a couple of weeks. We'll allow it to collect its data and then we'll, we'll use that a little bit later on. We've kind of covered this topic a few times. We do want to make sure that migrations, at least the website content migrations, can be rerun at any point in time. I really don't want to do another uh, uh, physical move, again, physical migration, but the, these content migrations, we want to be able to, to, to rerun those. Uh, and um, that's just, again, because the content will keep changing on your live site until that freeze. Uh, so it's going to be really helpful to be able to constantly pull in the latest content whenever we need to in our you know, testing environments and whatnot. Um, uh, and, and, and also keeping in mind, again, that idea of trying to fix the content at the source. If we do that, we can then test that that content was fixed and we can uh, make sure that that, uh, that, 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 that fix took, took the intended effect if we can rerun these migrations. It does take a bit of consideration because rerunning the migrations would probably mean uh, any changes made on that destination site will actually, you know, we'll, we'll lose that on, on the new site. So you do have to make some special considerations and plan for that, but it's, it's worth taking that time to, to do it. Uh, when it comes to actually starting trial runs of migrations, um, starting that as soon as possible is very important. I, I mentioned this earlier too, that it, you know, it'll take time when we find issues to discuss the right solutions and figure some of those things out. So the, the sooner that we can start running trial migrations, there's going to be a uh, better result in the end so we can take the time needed to solve those, those problems that, uh, that we come across. And now is also the time to start our, our test plan. Um, there will be a time when testing will actually be needed. Uh, so start, starting to develop the test plan earlier on in this phase uh, is going to be very important. Um, you probably did a little bit of this already in the planning phases earlier, but uh, now is the time to actually work with the development team, figure out what issues they're coming across that need to be tested, what are the various templates maybe that we need to go back and test, uh, getting together just that list of important pages. If you need you know, some additional uh, uh, people to help you with the testing, getting that all in order. So this is the time to really start thinking about that. Um, because at this point, we're now going to move into the actual uh, testing phase. Um, so at this point, you know, if we say that we're back into our uh, pristine house, uh, we moved in, uh, we brought along a couple of things. So now is the time to actually figure out how and where everything is going to fit. Did it, does it fit where we planned it? Um, did we bring over everything that we actually intended to? 
Um, so this is really the, the, the UAT uh, phase, uh, the user acceptance testing. Um, so this comes back to you know, most of the people here in the room, this, the, the people who are the experts in your content, in your project, in your designs. Um, this is where you're going to be involved the most. Um, in our case, we've done some of those migrations that were 10 or 100,000 different pieces of content. Um, this is the complicated thing, is how do you test all that content? Uh, you can't really go in and look at 10,000 different pages. Uh, I mean, you could hire an army, I guess, to do it, but you probably don't want to. Um, so what we typically recommend is, is a couple of things. Number one would be spot checking. Uh, so again, working with the team, the developers, all the content folks to figure out a percentage of those pages that should be checked, um, what templates should be looked at, uh, the difficulties of some of those, um, Maybe it's based on the features on some of those pages or the components on those pages. Uh, so again, this is considered earlier on in the process, but uh, this is now the time to actually uh, put that all into place. We also think about automation when we're dealing with this large number of, of, uh, of content. Uh, it can be a little more difficult, and this is really the, the, the thing that your development team would work on. Um, but there are options to help to automate some of this testing. Uh, we have a tool that, that's an open source tool called SiteDiff that we use to compare snapshots of, of, uh, of, a, of the, the output of pages so we can pick up on like things like maybe missing translations or images or various things like that. Um, but again, that's for your development team to really focus on because uh, there's no way you're going to be able to test 10,000 or 100,000 different pages. Um, so we also recommend using uh, data in this whole process. And I'm wondering, is there anybody in the room that, that you know, is a website owner or, or administrator and, and doesn't have an administrative, or sorry, an analytics package on their website? I feel like that's a, that's a no. So I think everybody here has like Google Analytics or uh, one of the other alternatives on their website already. And that data can be so incredibly important in this process. We can use that to help us develop uh, the test plan to help us prioritize things and know actually what we need to test. And so what are we actually testing? Um, well, first of all, we want to make sure that all the migrated content that we expected to migrate was actually migrated. Uh, we also want to make sure that you know, images and, and files and everything are in place, um, that all the translations are, are all working as expected, and, and any other uh, references, for example, content relationships, taxonomies, uh, related content widgets, um, any transformations that might have taken place, like when we're extracting some content and pushing it into a new field. Uh, the layouts, the visuals of the page, does it all sort of come across correctly? Does it look okay? Those redirects I was talking earlier, it's important to test those, otherwise they're not going to work and you know, they're, they're, they weren't really all that effective. Uh, all the links, you know, making sure that there's no uh, broken links on the pages, that all the URLs are correct. Uh, maybe that there's no old test site URLs in there that might sort of be a relic of, uh, of the migration process. And then also the, the metadata, like this, uh, the SEO metadata, you know, uh, keywords, descriptions, et cetera, that, that, that all came across too. Um, and there's actually like probably a lot more as well, and that's again, in this process you'll develop all, uh, what that all looks like. But the other thing to consider is maybe at some point, you know, perfect is the enemy of good, right? Maybe at some point it's sort of good enough. Um, be willing to accept that there might be some cases where it's just not worth continuing to try to make something perfect. For example, a 10-year-old news article maybe doesn't need to be pixel perfect anymore. Maybe there's a set in that 10 years, one or two, that actually do need to be because they still have high traffic, you know, maybe there's a big announcement or something. But maybe the rest of them don't need to be all that perfect. So it's worth considering that as well. Okay, so now the testing is done. We're on to the actual moving day. Um, so everything's packed up and you're ready to hit the road and ready to, to, to get going. But what does moving day actually look like um, in this case? Because we've done a whole bunch of preparation, we've figured everything out, um, we hit the button to run all the scripts and flip everything over and that should be that. Uh, it should actually be a pretty quiet and seamless day if everything went according to plan. Um, but we have to make sure that everything did go according to plan. So now, now we're actually going to put that, that final testing plan into place. Uh, so this is when that comes in to execute that and make sure that everything is looking good afterwards. This is also when we get into the monitoring. Um, in the coming days and weeks and months, just making sure that everything is still looking okay, that there's nothing that caused any problems. Uh, and this is where that search console really comes into play. So we can look at um, you know, the, the results of 
the, 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 the search crawls and see if there's any error messages, for example, in the, in the crawls, if there's pages that couldn't be indexed or if there's redirect loops because of some of those redirect rules. Um, some of this is probably more gonna be things that your developers would need to work on, but it's good to monitor that and see what the trends are uh, and I'd probably recommend in the days following the migration looking at this daily uh, in the weeks following, maybe looking at it a couple of times a week, and you know, then just keeping a watch on it in the in the in the in the months following after that. The next thing we can also do is resubmit our sitemap to uh, to the, the the tools to Google in this case. Um, that will hopefully maybe encourage them to recrawl your website. We don't really know what it does, but we still kind of like to try it and hope that it'll cause Google to actually go back and, and crawl it. And maybe that'll mean that we'll get some of these results coming in sooner and then you know, having less uh, impact if there are any, any issues that come out of that process. So that's it, uh, congratulations. The migration is done and hopefully everything went, out with, went off without a hitch. So what, what did you learn along the road? Uh, don't even move. <laughs> <laughs> that's for Jesse. And, for me as well, if I need to move to another city, um, no, not on, not on the foreseeable future. But um, if you do have to move, uh, take the time to prepare and clean up ahead of time. That's the most important things. And did I already say that? Don't underestimate the discovery phase. And hopefully we learn and you learn uh, other things too during this session. Before we end, uh, we uh, Evolving Web were organizing uh, a bunch of events called Evolve Drupal uh, next one is on June 14 in Montreal, and then it's going to be in September in New York. And basically we'll talk about everything Drupal during these events, design, accessibility, development, of course. So if you want to, to join, you can find details here, and you're more than welcome. And thank you. And we if you have, have some questions. Yeah, we have like uh, ten-ish minutes for any questions. If anyone has any. Yeah, I'm just curious about that data transfer table. Like, who works? Who creates that? Is it a combination between non-dev and dev? Because I'd be able to understand like the fields and all that requires. I would imagine some technical knowledge. Yeah, good question. So yeah, the question was basically who creates the data transfer table. Um, and it is a probably mostly reliant on, at least on our side, on the dev team and the project managers who understand the content structure. Uh, somewhat even on the, like the UX uh, folks that know, again, the content structure. Um, on the other side of it, having the, the, the content people or the site administrators involved at least, you know, maybe like more like informed and not, you know, um, maybe not uh, um, uh, super involved, but They'll have to answer questions. They'll have to um, to get involved in some way. It always depends on the project. It depends on the team on 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 both sides. Uh, if there is a technical person, maybe with within our client team, then we might involve them a lot. Um, but if it's more of uh, they're a little more hands off and just focus on the content, then we might walk them through it at a certain point in the process. Uh, but it's mostly going to be on the developers or the you know solution architect or. Uh, the, the technical people on, on, on our side to really figure out those fields and to document everything throughout the whole discovery process. Just on the, with the uh, um, hat, as, yeah. As a developer who works with multiple sites on migration, uh, I find the hardest one is, uh, I mean, clean slate is easy, we keep, it, keep everything as easy, it's the middle client who wants to refresh or needs to train all certain things over. Do you have any tools Yeah, actually. Um, so the question was basically how can the content owners uh, try to understand what's on their website? Um, and um, we use a, a tool called Screaming Frog that is like a, a, a crawler that will well, crawl the whole website and help to expose anything on the site. Um, you know, if there's like really hidden content, it might not be able to find it if it's no longer linked, but it'll 
pull out the whole content structure, anything that's linked across the website. Um, and it gives us a lot of good data around like what's on those pages too, so we can figure out you know, the heading hierarchy on those pages, which is always nice when you're looking at a spreadsheet to understand what that page might be, especially if it's something you've never found. So um, I think Screaming Frog is one, definitely one recommendation. Um, what are some of the other tools that we've used to, uh, sorry? Gather content. Ah, okay. I'm not familiar with that one. That's so. That's a like a, a web-based tool or something. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a service. Thing. It's like a thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's yeah. Yeah. Ah. Uh, okay. Okay. All right, yeah, so gather content being uh, another tool that can be used to, to crawl a website. Um, and with, with Screaming Frog, at least, I know that we can have it crawl the, the site map or we can just have it just spider the whole site. And um, that's the most beneficial when we actually just have it find links, visit that link, find more links, and just keep going like that. And, and, and then it uncovers some of the, which we normally do that early on in the process, process too, because it under, uncovers some of the hidden structure that nobody knew about. You know, you'll see that from some of the URL structure that people have been creating over the years and the hierarchy, heading hierarchy and whatnot. So uh, and it exposes a whole bunch of really info, uh, really useful info. Yeah, we've, we've been using Screaming Frog with our agency for various years, and it is pretty remarkable. It, it can teach you a lot of lessons about the power of taxonomy and directory structure uh, that you might not have been aware of when you started with Git. So yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it does, yeah, it's great for SEO, it's great for, it does some more accessibility work. So just another plus one for, for Screaming Frog. Sorry, uh, you had a question, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering if you could talk more about the content freeze aspect. Um, how long does the content freeze you recommend? And are, do you put it like right before the, the launch day or do you put it a little bit earlier or before you put it in there? Yeah, uh, so just about the content freeze and how it fits into the timeline. Um, I mean, it varies. I would say we've had some cases where we can really limit that content freeze down to, um, I don't know if you've gotten to the matter of days, but maybe like a week or something like that. Um, I would say on average, we're probably looking at about two weeks. Um, and in that time, like we call it a content freeze, but really what that actually means is maybe if some emergency change needs to happen, it can happen on the live site, and then we just have to do the same thing on the, on the new site or something like that. But um, yeah, so I would say on average it's probably looking around two weeks, um, but it might be, yeah, it could be more or less depending on the project and depending on, uh, you know, how much, maybe how much work we can do to, to, to limit that. So uh, if the client uh, is constantly putting new content on their site every day, um, and they, like, would you re still recommend a two-week con content freeze in that case, or would you recommend something different? We could look at other options, like if there's, for example, if it's like news, right? News is probably going to be an easy one to handle because chances are it's not, once it's published, it might not change necessarily. So we would definitely look at maybe there's some ways that we can speed that up for certain types of content, well, maybe not others. Um, so there's certainly different options that we could, could figure out for, for that. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, we would always have at least a, a brief freeze. Um, uh, yeah, I would say al almost always. Um, let me just try to restate the, the, the question. So just like what, maybe is it sort of just like what the quality assurance process looks like once, once we turn it over, uh, we as the agency turn it back over to the, the, the client or the, the owners of the site? 
yeah, okay, okay. Um, I mean, yeah, that's that's a big part of the whole process along the way is developing the test plan and making sure that we have that all documented and that we uh, actually execute on that plan later on. So there's a whole bunch of different like checklists that we'll be developing along the way, including just like a standard like pre-launch checklist that we would go through just to make sure that everything that we need to, you know, the, the, all the changes, all the... Um, uh, you know the DNS changes are done correctly, and just a whole bunch of things on the on the like the pre-flight check. But then we have all the testing plans that were developed specifically for that site. Um, so that's when we would execute on that testing plan to make sure that everything was done correctly. Um, and then throughout the process, when we start thinking about the actual development of that, there's a whole bunch of things that we would do, like of course making sure that um, the development is is bug-free. We do code reviews and. Um, various other things to make sure that the, the code is all all in, you know is, is, is good and then um, uh, demos like sprint demos throughout the process as we're developing everything and um, yeah there's a there definitely needs to be a lot of that because when we're migrating that much content it can there's going to be issues that we're going to uncover and we need to spend the time to uncover those so it's a it's a whole process that we could probably spend a, a whole do a whole other session on basically just the, the QA process in general but um, I don't know if that helps at all to answer the question. But. Yeah, um, I was thinking more for like the front facing uh, to the front scanner in terms of like the design. Having the, because once we build it and we see the client, <laughs> they now have this new tool, right? And they go through look at their development team, look at all who the content has to get compiled yeah. and to like ensure sort of continuity across all these new. Um, yeah, so just like when when the once it's all completed, how do we like hand that over and ensure that that everything else is, is going to continue to to remain accurate in the future, I guess. Um, I mean, I guess another part of that is when we're doing those migrations, figuring out uh, what that content structure looks like, how that gets ported into different components. Um, and by making sure that we have a, a good component library, uh, with, which might you know, be part of the whole design system of the site, we're ensuring that when they start making changes to the content or adding new content, uh, that component library stands up to. So really, maybe some of that gets back to like sort of the, the theming uh, part of, of that process. Um, when we actually do the designing and the building of the theme itself, which we didn't you know, really talk too much about, um, but making sure that we bring all that content over and where we can at least bring it into the new design system if we have one. And that way it'll all work well and be on brand and fit well into the rest of the site as things evolve. Um, so. Typically, uh, how, how much do you charge to migrate content for the university website and uh, what, are, what is your cost based on? Oh, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> that it it varies so so widely the cost. Like we would usually want to understand a lot about what the content structure is, um, how much content there is, and because there's that that really heavy discovery phase, that's when we try to figure out like, you know, a, a manual migration uh, might be. Um, might actually cost significantly less because we wouldn't be doing very much of that. Whereas an automated migration, if it's a more complex content model, then we might have to handle handle that in different ways and automate that. So, um, yeah, it, it it varies so widely. Um, maybe we could you know connect afterwards and we can discuss what that might look like for if you had something in mind. Um, but it's it could go anywhere you know in any any range of of zero to anywhere up from there it's it's we've done small and we've done very very large migrations so it, it so much depends and it depends on mostly on the the um the the effort required uh which comes down to the, the hours required to, to do the work um, so we are being told that we're done if anybody else had any other questions or wanted to talk more deeply feel free to let us know we'll be around tomorrow at our booth and uh, around for the rest of the conference Thank you.